All right. Good morning, everyone. This is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester and host of the Forest Connect webinar series. And it's my pleasure today to welcome all of you uh, to join me in welcoming Mark Whitmore, a friend and colleague in the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell. And Mark is our go-to guy for all the bad bugs. And his bad bug du jour is the hemlock woolly adelgid. You didn't know I was uh, multilingual, did you, Mark? <laughs> this is new, <Snoopy. laughs> Yeah, that's, that's about the extent of it also, so don't push me. Okay. All right, well, with that, I will uh, turn this over to Mark, and I'm going to mute my microphone and sit here and enjoy. I will, uh, to all of you participants, I will um, independently send you the continuing education link. So if you're interested in continuing education credits, um, I have your information in the registration page, and I will send you that link, and I will also send you the exit survey. So with that, Mark, it's all yours. Okay. Well, thanks, Pete. I uh, must admit it's really nice to see uh, so many people online here and uh, many names of people uh, that I know well. So um, I, uh, I, I really thank you for this opportunity because I've been uh, thinking an awful lot about the Hemlock Willie Adelgid recently. And if you'll notice uh, by the title of my talk, I think we really can uh, finally uh, uh, do something with uh, this insect. And so, uh, you know, it's pretty depressing in the uh, world of uh, invasive forest pests these days, what with the uh, emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle and a couple other big bad ones coming down the pike. Uh, it's, it's important to think about what we can do, and I really do think that uh, we have a chance with the hemlock woolly adelgid. I just think we definitely uh, need to be cognizant of we don't have a lot of time. Uh, we know what happened in the south. Or many people know what happened in the south with so many trees dying. We have it up here in New York. It's basically just not just starting. It's been here a little bit, but we still have a lot of trees that are infested. And now is the time to start working on it uh, without without any uh, uh, how would you say uh, quickly. Um, so you know, just to sort of start off here. Uh, I want people to realize that uh, forest pests can be beneficial. Beneficial, I think they're an essential part of the ecosystem uh, because they provide the important ecosystem service of removing weak uh, uh, individuals from the uh, uh of a population. So, you know, it's like native insects. I think are, are important. We need to have trees dying. Just everything dies, uh, and so bugs point out the weak ones and they take them out. Um, the problem is that uh, when you have, well, a natural control of insect populations, basically there are three things. Host tree resistance, there's many factors. Uh, most are poorly understood for trees because they're actually quite complex organisms. Biological control, basically bugs eating bugs or predators, parasitoids, and pathogens. Um, and with biological control, I think it's important to realize it's not just one thing. It's sort of like additive. There are, you know, predators will take out a certain portion of the population, another predator will take out another part, and then you might get an additive thing of, of abiotic factors coming in. And so it all adds up uh, to the general control of uh, insect populations. Um, let me see here, me. There we go. So the problem with uh, the non-native non invasive forest pests is that they don't have a lot of these controls that control their population growth. And this is a, a, a litany of the, the really bad uh, bugs out there. You know, it was, it was, it's interesting to think about where we are with uh, importing these bugs. You know, are these the last ones we're going to get? No. Um, well, the sound could certainly be a lot better. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Is there a way to uh, fix that, Pete? Um, slow down a bit also. Okay. There, how's that? Is that better? I think that's better, yes. Okay, well, thank you. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's okay. I'm, I'm caught used to this. Okay, you so anyway, um, so here's a, a list of all the, you know, a lot of the major uh, non native insect forest pests that we've had. Um, and you see that nice bright line drawn down through there. I was, I was thinking about this the other day, just looking at this list. And, um, there's sort of like a break between like Dutch elm disease. I'm not really sure when that came in. 1928 is a, a time when it's all, you know, when 
we talk about winter moth also it's prior to 1930, but elongate hemlock scale, balsam lily adelgid, hemlock lily adelgid, you know, very likely uh, much earlier in the 1900s. This is pre the uh, uh, quarantine 37 import regulations, which were put in place uh, in 1912. And so I think that, you know, I think we could take heart that, you know, the import regulations that we put in place have done something. Um, you know, certainly we have a long ways to go. Um, evidenced by the fact that now we have the spru brown spruce longhorn beetle and the last four thousand tank well, thousand tankers and gold spotted oak borer are actually North American species, but then the Asian longhorn beetle. So, you know, we're we're, we're working on it. I think there's hope uh, for the regulations, and certainly at the uh, meetings I was at just recently in Annapolis, where people were talking about the pathways and how we look at this, I can see a lot of good thought going into hopefully stemming the tide of uh, these insects coming into North America and wreaking havoc in our forests. Um, is it good? Okay, sorry it's garbled. I, okay, I'll try and hold this. Okay, um, so is that better? Is it better when I talk like that? I can't, yes, okay, thank you. Um, I'll try not to eat the microphone as I speak. So um, basically, the hemlock lily adelgid. This is one I think that um, I think we really have a chance at working on now. Uh, the history of it is that it was introduced, say, in um, we're not really sure. It was first really detected as being a problem in the Richmond area around 1950, and um, you know the thought is is that it probably came in a lot earlier than that. And indeed, uh, I was just speaking with one of my colleagues, Nathan Havel, who mentioned that. Um, there, there was a time when uh, Japanese gardens were all the rage, and there was a big Japanese garden created in the uh, uh, Richmond area in around 1910, 1911. And it might have been brought in maybe perhaps on uh, Japanese hemlock trees, um, because you can't have a Japanese, hemlock, Japanese garden without uh, Japanese hemlocks, which are resistant, but then it took a long time for them to get going. So. Um, since that time, it's spread, and I'll show maps a little bit further on. But the life cycle of the hemlock lily adelgid is actually this. This makes it look really simple, uh, and I'll show you how complex it can get. But in North America, uh, we have basically two uh, two generations a year. We call them the systems and the uh, progredience generation. Okay, the systems generation is actually what's growing right now. And if you'll notice, oh, let me see the pointer here. I'll, uh, uh, okay, Pete showed me this. So the systems generation, you know, right now it's growing. Basically, um, it starts growing probably in August, October, November, and it grows all the way through the winter uh, whenever temperatures allow it to uh, develop. It can't, you know, it's just like any other insect, it's cold blooded, so when it gets really cold, it can't really do much of anything. And so then in March, it actually begins laying eggs uh, of the progredience generation, which will then hatch. And then they will lay eggs perhaps in early June. Uh, it all, of course, depends on temperature. Uh, and then those will hatch and form the cystent generation. And the cystent generation then actually develops the first instar hatches. Right here, the crawler hatches. It's the only dispersal stage of this insect. The egg hatches from the egg sac of the, uh, of the adult. And it settles and forms the first instar uh, that it estivates. And this is what it looks like in summertime, this little tiny black dot with its mouth parts inserted into the ray parench uh, the, um, ray parenchyma cells. And so it actually stays just like this in a resting stage all through summertime and then breaks its estivation and starts developing then perhaps in late October. Um, Where's the next slide that's going on? Oh, there we go. So here's just to show you how complex this actually gets. Um, the adelgids, uh, I should say the adelgids are uh, a very complex group. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's aphids, uh, they're a part of the aphids. Families of the aphidoidea. Um, there's the uh, aphidoidae, uh, which um, actually is my uh, major professor uh, at the University of Washington said they're the ones with tailpipes. And then you have the phyloxerids and the adelgids without tailpipes. Well, the phyloxerids, they are 
aphidoidea, the rest of the aphidoidea, they feed on deciduous trees, whereas the adelgids feed only on conifers. And the adelgids have this life cycle that is amazing. On the spruce, the primary host, they have three life forms. And on some hemlock, the secondary host, they have two different generations. Um, so in North America, we don't have any spruce that are uh, adequate for the development of the hemlock or the adelgid. Only the secondary host hemlock is present. You see here hemlock, we have the two generations, the assistance generation, then the spring viridians generation. And here you can see this nice little arrow right here. This is interesting because um, the adults Okay, so the progredients lay the eggs of the systems, which then go through the long summertime period and then begin developing uh, throughout the winter, and then lay their eggs in, in, or in late winter, early spring, that turn into progredients. So that's the... ...pictures of the crawler and the nymph, like this little dot is bugging me, not driving me crazy, but anyway, okay, I guess I can live with that. So the crawler and the nymph, um, Basically, here you have the egg sacs developing, and this is the little tiny crawler. So if the adult is about a millimeter in size, a little bit more than that, and just you can see the crawler is just teeny and tiny. So after the egg hatch, the crawler comes out. Here you can see its legs. If you look at it under a dissecting scope, it's actually really fast, um, and it, but it is the only dispersal stage. So the crawler comes out. It finds a, a good feeding site. It inserts its stylets into the host tissue. Uh, and then it stays in that place for the rest of its life. Uh, it, it then changes into the uh, uh, the estimating stage right here, uh, which is called the nymph. Uh, the progredients generation, remember the second generation that comes about in springtime, does not go through a resting stage, so it just continues development. So, um, okay, uh, I'm finished with this slide. Here is a, a picture of the adult, and these are really interesting animals. You know, it looks pretty dang ugly, doesn't it? Um, but it's it's really a, a fascinating uh, uh, insect developed to exploit its food source uh, perfectly. Um, here you can see the mouth parts right here. They're actually unwound. Um, the mouth parts consist of a number of different, uh, 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 how do you say, uh, 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 Straw-like, uh, not they don't they're not hollow in the middle, but they form a sucking tube, and they put they insert that into the uh, host tissue. And it's interesting if you're dissecting them, you can pull them out, and you know even though they they never move, you can actually pull them out. You can see that stylet come out, and they'll be whipping around uh, uh, um, like sort of like a, a, a long tail or something. Uh, but then you also look at it, it has these pores right here. These are the pores. Uh, that form the white woolly wax that you see uh, all over the adult. And here you can see the white woolly wax right here. Um, not really good view of the mouth parts, um, but then this is what we call the egg sac. And these egg sacs have been basically dissected, so you can see all the eggs being laid. Um, the amount of eggs that they lay uh, varies. The uh, cystins are more fecund than the Providian's generation. And the cystins generation produces perhaps up to 200 eggs, whereas the Providian's may be up to 100 eggs. But I think that you know the number of eggs produced uh, depends on a number of characters, uh, you know, how host quality, density of, of the insects on them. So it varies wild, wild, uh, widely. Um, and cystins eggs ha egg hatch is more punctuated than the progredients. You know, think about it, the uh, system sort of comes out of the winter time, you got the warm temperatures, and boom, it starts developing. Then the progredients generation hatches, it's over a more prolonged period of time, and so the egg hatch, you can get all different uh, uh, stages of the progredients in one place at one point in time. So the impact on the trees, basically, it inserts its stylets at the base of the needle and feeds on the xylem rape parenchyma cells. And what this does is actually it, it elicits a reaction, I think, 
by the tree uh, to to that uh, generic injury of the insertion of the of the uh, stylus into that tissue, and by sort of walling that off, um, it's it's clogging its own vascular system, and um, that will impede the transport of uh, nutrients uh, into the um, buds and leaves and and will actually kill them over time. It usually kills trees with the four to 10 years in the south in the Appalachian Mountains. It'll be a lot, it'll be four years, maybe even less. Um, and uh, 10 years uh, where it gets really cold. Uh, my, my colleague, Joe Elkerton, likes to uh, tell me he's been watching a hemlock tree that's been infested for 17 years in Appalachian, Massachusetts. And the last time I was there visiting, I asked him to see that tree, and he said, oh, too bad, they just cut it down. Oh, well, I didn't get to see that. Another important thing to think about is that old trees really are the first to die. They're, they're the ones where their vascular system is, is could be compromised. It's getting older. Um, uh, but the young trees, they're really vigorous. They have a, a vigorous crown for them. They're able to you know, drag the photosynthase. They can actually stand infestation for a lot longer. Okay, the worldwide distribution of uh, Tsuga, uh, this this shows it right here. Uh, Nathan Havel's done a great work with uh, Tsuga and with uh, uh, Delgis. We have the Chinese species, the Japanese species, and then the American species here. Interestingly, there's there's basically five populations of Hemocolia delgis that are native, uh, considered native to the region and in, in, in the world. And so they are uh, in China. Taiwan, and there's two in Japan, higher elevation, Diversifolia, and one on Seboldii, and then one from the Pacific Northwest. Um, the population established in the, in the, on the East Coast here comes actually from the region of uh, Sugat Seboldii in South Japan. Um, and it's really interesting also what happens here in the Pacific, Pacific Northwest. There's, once again, there's no, no sex with the hemlock lily delta in the Pacific Northwest. So for a long time, we were considering it also to be invasive. But uh, Nathan's work has shown that actually it's been there a long time. And, um, and it just has lost the capacity to, to have the sexual generation. Also, interestingly enough, uh, Tsuga Hirakwa and the Tensiana on the West Coast are actually very closely related species. And that, when I heard that, I just couldn't believe it because Mertensiana looks very, very different from Heterophila. But the other interesting thing is I've never seen Hemlocholia delta on Suga Mertensiana or Mountain Hemlock, but it is on Suga Heterophila. And here's another interesting thing. Uh, I went back to, uh, I'm from Washington State, and it finally dawned on me that, you know, it'd be cool to see if there's any uh, uh, eastern hemlock planted uh, in the Arboretum in Seattle. So I went back there visiting Mom and Dad, and, and I went to the Arboretum, and the guy says, oh, yeah, sure. Western hemlock, so you can see we have different hemlock, uh, a cancer live infestations of hemlock will be added. Um, so let me move on here. So the host trees in North America are eastern hemlock, Carolina hemlock, and western hemlock. Western Of uh, the reproductive potential is really remarkable. Uh, all you need to do is have one egg sac. Uh, there's two generations a year and up to 300 eggs. Uh, I don't think, where did I get that 300 eggs thing? I don't like it at all. Um, but anyway, I must miss.
that's a question that you know, maybe, but, you know, it's something to make it perhaps a little bit more resistant. We don't really know. There's no documented resistance by Eastern hem in, in Eastern Hemlock Coast. Um, now, that's, I'm, I'm not so sure about that now. I've been down into northern New Jersey, and I've seen a scan um, that, that I'm really scratching my head on. Maybe there is some kind of resistance going on there, but we just we really need to do a lot of research on that. We don't really have any area-wide uh, chemical treatments available. Um, there are, it's very difficult to detect hemlock oil bills at low population levels. So when you finally do detect it, it's already going crazy. Um, and I think that uh, you know hemlock death, when if you just refer just to let it go, it will create a genetic bottleneck in the species that really uh, uh, reduces the future viability of hemlock. Uh, we really need to start preserving, I think, the genome of hemlock and pay attention to it. This is an old map, 2008, but it just I like it because it shows the distribution of hemlock here in, in blue, and uh, here's the hemlock in the hatched areas, the hemlock where it builds. So it has changed. It's sort of filled in in here, and it's moving up uh, in, in this area, and in, in Vermont, and into Maine a little bit further. But this shows you that here you have Carolina hemlock fully in, in, in fully engaged of the hemlock really adapted, and it, it's really beginning to fill in uh, its, uh, the range of hemlock. Um, and indeed, uh, it's, we have it, uh, our Canadian friends have it right up here in the Niagara River area. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it's spreading. Uh, are we at the beginning of this thing? No. Are we in the middle? Probably. So if you look at the hemlock resources in New York State, I, I love this map because it really uh, gives you a feel for you know, where, where we have a lot of hemlock. Here we have the Catskills. Look at the Adirondacks here. If you've ever been on the eastern slopes of the Adirondacks, there's large contiguous forest of hemlock. Uh, and then in the Tug Hill area. But out here in the Finger Lakes area, it's, it's not as, uh, uh, it's not as dense, but perhaps it's more, uh, ecologically important because it harbors, uh, unique, uh, habitats. Um, sort of like in islands all throughout the Finger Lakes uh, here. This is, I hope this is working. Can I get a thumbs up from people there? Um, this is a, a, a map of the, of the expansion of hemlock woolly adelty created by my, my friend Scott McDonald at New York State uh, DEC. And just to give you an idea of uh, how it's been moving and perhaps how quickly it's been moving. So there we are in 2013. Um, let's see if we can start this over. Valley moving up Long Island. And then we got something up in Buffalo, which is really not doing much in Rochester. I know Jerry took care of the Rochester infestation, but it's come back a little bit. Then we got into the Finger Lakes, and it's been really moving quickly in the Finger Lakes. And so now, about Hemophilia Delta is that it's limited by cold temperatures. Um, and I originally, when we first started thinking about it around here, I was thinking, okay, we're up north. So it gets cold around here. And um, okay, I'll talk about cold temperatures. Uh, so, but then I, I uh, was talking to my uh, my friend, Arthur Gitano here at the Northeast Regional Climate Center, and he put together this map. And all of a sudden, I realized that we really uh, aren't that fortunate. Uh, here in the Finger Lakes area, you see it looks awful lot like the temperatures, the low temperatures down here in the Delaware Water Gap, uh, where mortality shows up six years or so. Uh, indeed, we are beginning to see mortality, just beginning to see mortality around here, and that's about six, seven years. So the Ontario Plain is actually quite warm, but then when we get up in the uplands, you know, we can see that it gets much colder. So temperatures up here in the upper Adirondacks, remember this is a 10-year period of time, they get down to minus 30, uh, not up into the minus 35 zone. And uh, but down here, uh, you know, it's like maybe minus 20. I, quite frankly, I have never seen anything lower than minus 13 degrees in the Ithaca area. But the thing to remember, there's two things to remember about the cold impacts. I know you've all been hearing about this recently. Is that 
number one, this insect can, uh, if it survives, it can start a whole new population, potentially just with one individual. Um, and there's research that shows that cold tolerance is actually genetically controlled. So if that individual that survives, that one individual that survives is cold tolerant, it doesn't need to find a mate. It can just start reproducing, and it can produce a lot of individuals very quickly within a one-year period of time. So research, you know, I think it varies. Uh, cold tolerance is actually a very complex issue. You know, there's hardening, the, the uh, you know, after the warm fall, uh, there needs to be a period of cold, maybe so that they can they can harden off and get their real uh, get their tolerance level down. And then it remains low, and then it warms up again in spring. So maybe you know cold temperatures in fall or in spring would be far more damaging than those right now. I know I did uh, uh, some sampling with that cold snap at the end of November, and I found 40% mortality. I'm not really sure what the temperatures got down to, and the uh, the temperature gauges around Ithaca uh, said minus one. I actually have not uh, retrieved my temperature information when I did the sampling. But experimental evidence shows that you know, we get you know, a significant mortality down uh, minus 15 degrees, you know, maybe you know, up to 70 percent or so, minus 20, and pretty much full die off between minus 30 and minus 35. But remember, all we need is one individual to survive. Um, and the population can, can go uh, can can rebound. So yes, it's been cold. Yes, it's going to uh, uh, probably throw a real uh, a loop to the populations, but uh, it's not going to go away. Um, and uh, I think that it could actually drive them to become a more tolerant population in, in general. I, I'm just not really sure. We definitely need more research on those variants. So to consider the economic Ecological and they moderate uh, hemlocks are so important. They moderate stream temperatures for trout, which are really important to me. And other animals, uh, uh, they uh, they provide a buffer for nutrient inputs uh, to maintain water quality. And the soils they st stabilize shallow soils, especially in steep gorges, uh, around like around here in the Figure Lakes area, and I'm sure elsewhere. Uh, the soil chemistry is made more acidic. And I'm, I'm not really an, uh, 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 well versed in soil art. Whatever, but I can't out but imagine that when you get a diversity of soil acidity, you'll get a diversity of critical habitat for migrating some migrating neotropical birds. And it's interesting, I was reading a paper recently from England where they actually were talking about um, ash, and they're talking about the loss of ash uh, because of the Tillara disease, and certainly on the ash borer right along behind it. But they're talking about how the ash actually provides uh, a substrate uh, that's different from other trees for lichens, and some of them were quite rare. And so I'm wondering, well, if you have a, uh, the, and the hemlock is undoubtedly an acidic substrate for lichens, and in the uh, vast uh, broadleaf forests of the East Coast, that could be an important harbor for some of the species. Um, mortality opens the stand to invasive plant species, and this can be really important because it can impede the establishment of desired forest species. Um, here's a, a nice picture. I just love this uh, shot of uh, Skinny Atlas Lake and the, the, uh, the Bear Swamp Creek coming down into it, and all throughout this area, very steep hillsides covered with uh, hemlock trees. And here you have the, uh, of course, the nutrient inputs from the local farm. And you can see how very clearly with this picture how it might be an important buffer uh, for, for water quality. Uh, and this is what we're seeing. This is uh, perhaps one of the first trees to die uh, in the Finger Lakes area here. Uh, definitely six years It's after uh, we detected it in the area. And um, this happened to be the biggest tree in the park. So. What can we do uh, um, for how do we control the hemorrhagia adelgid? Uh, there's basically chemical control uh, comes in two two versions. We have topical chemical control uh, that would be like mineral oil or soaks where you cover where you lather up the insects and it suffocates them. Uh, a thorough application is required for this, and here you can see it looks lovely here with all that spray all over the place, but uh, getting the spray up into the top of the tree is, is difficult, and um, access for the spray rigs is, is limited. 
And so this is definitely something that uh, works at knocking down populations, but its applicability is limited to areas uh, where you have the, uh, you're able to get in there. And then remember, all you need to do is have a couple of them survive, and boom, you're going to have a population that's going to sneak back up on you. So systemic insecticides are, are actually proving to be a really viable uh, technique uh, for, I think, managing the insect. It's a really valuable tool in our toolkit uh, for uh, my final goal of uh, maintaining hemlock on the landscape. Uh, there are three uh, chemicals that we have right now registered in the state that I consider uh, uh, the most important for, uh, uh, for, for use. There are many different formulations of metacloprid. In the metacloprid, there's time release tablets, uh, but it's a restricted use chemical, uh, restricted to uh, registered pesticide applicators. There is a soil grant available to homeowners. I worry about homeowners getting in there and drenching their hemlock right next to streams because the metacloprid will kill it, get into stream water if it's used in excess and uh, uh, kill the uh, uh, stream macroinvertebrates. Um, it's but the really cool thing about metacloprid, uh, the research by that Rick Powell has done shows that it's effective for seven years or more. The metacloprid itself disappears after one year, just like it does in most trees um, when it's applied. But there's uh, actually it changes into an olefin, which is also very toxic uh, and the, to the hemlock oleodelgid. And that persists for, for a long time. Um, the one problem with the metacloprid, it is very slow to move through the tree. So the uptake, it's a, it, it loves to adhere to carbohydrates. So its uptake through the vascular system is slow. Dinotifuran, on the other hand, it's another neonicotinid. Um, it's very fast movement in the tree. It's very water soluble. And so um, it's being used as a basal bark spray in New York. We have a special local needs license for this, once again licensed pesticide applicators only. Um, it's only good for one, maybe two years in the tree. So what we're finding is that we need to use both of those. A new actor on the block that I'm very, very interested in is azadiractin, and we call it TRIAs. And it was actually developed um, by the Canadians. Uh, the Canadian Forest Service uh, funded a lot of research on it. And this is basically an insect growth regulator. Uh, it was discovered, uh, it's, uh, it's actually azadiractin is the active ingredient in neem. Um, and uh, I don't know if you've heard of neem, but the neem tree uh, is actually, it was, it's an interesting story. The neem was discovered actually in the area of Africa where locusts uh, go berserk. And an entomologist uh, was there at the time, studied the locust, and noticed that there was one tree that didn't get touched, and that was the neem tree. Uh, so that research has been going on for a long time. Uh, and they, for a long time, it was very expensive because they had to actually extract as a directant from the neem tree directly. But now it's been chemically synthesized and it's available in a relatively inexpensive form. The problem is I just have no efficacy data right now. Uh, we're looking at control for one year or more, which is good. And this is definitely something to consider, uh, but we just don't have the efficacy data. Uh, um, and, but I'd like to see that work get done. So for systemic insecticides, our current best management practices, for old trees showing decline, you need a basal bark spray of vanitefuran to move rapidly up into the crown to preserve the canopy so it can get a metacloprid up into the canopy uh, to protect it for the, long, for the long haul, basically. And so in metacloprid, there's two different formulations that uh, we're looking at. Cortex is a time-release tablet formulation, easy to apply. Uh, they're using it a lot in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park right now, trying to preserve 1% of the hemlocks. Um, and there's also a basal bark spray, uh, which we just got registered in New York State, so that a metacloprid and dinotrephurin can be applied at the same time uh, in a tank mixture. Once again, by uh, registered pesticide applicators only. This is not available to homeowners. Um, Younger trees uh, without much canopy deterioration can be treated with time release, soil drench, or basal bark spray of the cloprid. And they have enough canopy in them to finally get that to get that slow moving metacloprid up and control the hemlock oleodelgid. Now, I think the future of uh, the hemlock oleodelgid in the eastern United States is going to rely on the successful implementation of biological control. So. 
It's a hemlock coolie adulthood at first detected in the United States in 1951 that was first recorded, probably been there a long time. And it spread uh, gradually throughout the southern Appalachians and then finally up here. The control, this classical biological control program was initiated in 1993. The very interesting thing about the hemlock coolie adulthood is there's no parasitoids. Now, parasitoids are wasps, and uh, the aphids have tons of parasitoids, uh, and, but these little wasps, you know, the, the wasps, they sting the, uh, the aphid and they'll lay their egg in there. There's absolutely none on the adelgids, uh, and there's also no specific pathogens. So what we've done is we've focused on what we do find, which are coccinellid or ladybird beetles and, and derodontid. There's no common name for derodontid beetle uh, from Eastern Asia and the Pacific Northwest. To date, there have been six species released, uh, in, and two of them in New York. Um, there's also a fly, a chemimide fly. I'm going to talk about this, Leucolepsis. Uh, it's been found to be important in the Pacific Northwest, uh, but their introduction is hampered by parasitoids, and that makes it difficult with rearing. Um, there's also taxonomic uncertainties with this, but you know, basically it means that with Leucolepsis, you have to work only with the adults, which obviously if they if they actually develop to the adult state, they're not parasitized. So I'm going to go through some of these insects. Uh, the insect that has been worked with the most uh, on the East Coast is this coccinellid beetle, this ladybird beetle, uh, Sasagis gymnasugei. Uh, Sasagis gymnasugei is native to Japan. Um, it has a, a closely uh, synchronized life cycle. Um, it overwinters as an adult, uh, lays its egg eggs in synchrony with egg laying by hemlock woolly adulthood in the spring. There are two generations a year, just like with hemlock woolly adulthood. Uh, and it feeds also, the thing that's different about this uh, from some of the others I'm going to speak with is that it actually feeds on the estivating hemlock woolly adulthood in the summer. It's the only predator that we've been working with to date uh, to do this. Uh, it was first released in Connecticut in 1995. In New York, it has been released at 12 sites in, in seven, I don't know what that seven's about. I'm gonna to have to, uh, oh, in seven Lower Hudson Valley counties from 1999 uh, through 2004. Um, they released about 2,000 per release. Uh, unfortunately, we have not any, we do not have any recoveries. And actually, I think throughout the uh, Eastern Seaboard, there have been um, uh, releases, they're talking about upwards of three million of these have been released, and indeed, not only in New York, but the recovery of this insect uh, throughout the area of its release has been very low at, at best. And so, um, you know, there's been a lot of question about its effectiveness if it's if it's not really recovered. And so, I think we've we've been looking away from this insect at this point in time, and we've been focusing on others. Here's another uh, coccinella beetle. Um, this is called Skimnus camptodromus. Oh, we have another question. Um, there's some private lands. Well, Pete, why don't you keep track of these questions? I'm just going to continue here. I'm going to leave some time for talking about the, the questions. So it's a native to China. Uh, it's recently been brought over, and they're working on it right now, going through the approval uh, uh, process, which includes uh, a long host specificity trial. And uh, so the petition for release is being filed soon. Um, it has the closest synchrony with hemlock lily adulthood life cycle of any predator uh, yet. It's active through the winter with the summer diapause. Uh, the adults begin laying eggs soon after they come out of the soil in the um, in the uh, uh, fall time. So actually there's eggs present uh, at the same time that the, uh, the adulthood start to grow in fall and then they grow and lay their eggs also uh, when the adelgid eggs are formed. So very close synchrony. Um, the only problem with this is it's very difficult to rear in the lab. Um, and I'm hopefully going to get some of these as soon as they are available and uh, put them into my field insectary here in Ithaca. And I'll talk more about that later. But here's the larva. You can see it's in there feeding on the adelgids, which are actually laying eggs. This is the egg sac of the adelgids. Here's an adult feeding on the egg sac right there. Um, here's that fly I was talking about, the Pupsis argenticolis. Um, it's in the Camimide uh, family of, of the flies. 
Um, interesting enough, it's the second most abundant predator of hemlock woolly adelgid in the Pacific Northwest. The first is Laracobius nigrinus, which I'm working with now. I'm trying to devote a, long, a lot of time to. Um, it has a whole Arctic distribution. I mean, it's found the same species is found all around the world in the uh, uh, in the northern hemisphere, um, and it is indeed native to New York. Uh, I have never found it uh, associated with hemlock woolly adelgid up here, but uh, down in North Carolina, where I was collecting the Recobius migrinus for release up here, I was beet sheeting uh, a hemlock woolly adelgid, and I did find some down there. So is it switching over to hemlock woolly adelgid? You know, there's a lot of questions about this insect. Uh, you know, it's like, is it really the same species? Are there races? Um, so. But suffice it to say, the larvae, you know, there's a lot of them out there. The larvae feed on the, both the pervidians and the cystins eggs. Um, and there appears to be adequate niche separation, which means there's a little competition with Laracobius nigrinus in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but once again, I remember I mentioned that uh, this fly has a lot of parasitoids, has parasitoids associated with it. And so if we're going to work with it, we have to be bringing in only the adults um, which will not be parasitized. So let's move on to Laracobius migrinus. This is the, the focus, I think, of our biocontrol uh, efforts right now on the East Coast. The genus um, Laracobius, the, the Coleoptera, the beetles, the family Derodontidae. There are four genera in the family worldwide. Three of them feed on fungus. Only Laracobius feeds on other insects, and Laracobius feeds only on adelgids. The genus Laracobius occurs throughout the northern hemisphere, basically wherever adelgids are present. And there are 20 species uh, of Laracobius present worldwide. 15 are native to Asia. There's been a lot of work on the taxonomy of this insect uh, since our, the hemlock woolly adelgid has provoked so much interest out here in the East Coast. One is native to Europe. Interesting enough, that's already been introduced into North America to control a close relative of the hemlock woolly adelgid called the balsam woolly adelgid. Now, it has been established, but there hasn't been a lot of work done on balsam woolly adelgid now, so I'm not sure how far that remains established in the, in the Northeast or in, the, in, in North America. There are three native species of Laracobius in North America. Two species are found on the West Coast, Laracobius laticollis and Laracobius nigrinus. Laticollis eats adelgis culei, which is found on spruce and on uh, Douglas fir trees. Um, there's only one that's native on the east coast here, that's Laracobius rubidus, that eats the pine bark adelgid, Pinea strobi, which grows on white pine. Um, um, the life cycle of Laracobius nigrinus, it's very good synchrony with the hemlock woolly adelgid. The adults emerge from the soil in the fall, just as the HW, just as the hemlock woolly adelgid systems are beginning to feed. Now, this is sort of a, a, a weak point in the life cycle because if it emerges too early and there's no HWA systems out there beginning to fatten up for them, uh, it could be real stressful because they spent their whole life uh, over the summertime um, in the soil. And so when they come out, they're probably really hungry. Adults feed on the developing systems through the winters as temperatures allow. And remember our discussion about uh, cold temperatures. I've been thinking an awful lot about uh, the Laracobius that are out here. And you know, they, you know, the hemlock woolly adelgid actually they have to be able to tolerate cold temperatures. And um, but the uh, Laracobius actually has another option to it. It can avoid cold temperatures. And so there's been work that shows that actually when Laracobius is is out in the the field in what we call a, a you know bag experiments where you where you trap them in a bag and wrap that around a branch. And so when the people go to look at that bag uh, to see where the Laracobius is in cold weather, they're all bunched in where the bag is tightly wound around the branch. So they're actually out there behaviorally trying to avoid the cold by getting away from those exposed situations. The adults lay their eggs in the cistern's oversack, so in the spring, so they feed throughout the winter uh, whenever the temperatures allow them to come up and, and start feeding. Um, and so they lay their eggs in the oversacks um, that are produced and they feed, the larvae then hatch and they feed on the on the progredient's eggs. The eggs that hatch from the cistern 
are the progridians generation. And so they feed on the eggs or early instar nymphs. Uh, apparently, if no eggs are available, they'll, they'll go to the nymphs, but they really prefer the eggs. And remember also, the progridians generation, there's a lot of overlap um, in, the, in the timing. So there'll be eggs present uh, over a long period of time with the progridians generation, whereas it's very punctuated. It's, it's the eggs are there only a short time with the cystins generation. So then the fourth instar larvae uh, will then drop to the forest floor and pupate in the soil. And they'll quickly, uh, after they're, they go through the pupil stage and the adults will then emerge from the pupil stage and then they'll enter the estival stage uh, until fall. So they'll, they will also estivate in the soil until fall. And then they will emerge uh, in the fall, hopefully when the hemlock lily adult do this night, it's beginning to fatten up and so they have, so they can feed. So the story of Lercobius nigrinus um, uh, being used as a biological control, basically it's, it's been used, released in a, in a somewhat operational sense since 2003. It's been released in 16 states on the East Coast, all the way from Georgia up into uh, Maine, Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, uh, and New York. Um, establishment has been found at many locations, but you know one of the problems we're having right now is really figuring out what has been the impact of hemlock lily adelgid, uh on uh, and uh, on the hemlock lily adelgid populations. Um, and it's been really difficult to assess. Uh, I think until uh, uh, 2012, where um, they really became common, and uh, we began finding large numbers of them. Still, experimental evidence uh, is hard to come by. Um, we really need to do to uh, get some experiments going throughout the range uh, of hemlock lily adelgid and Vericobius to really nail down what the impacts are, so we can fine tune uh, our use of this insect in biological control. But suffice to say, in Banner Elk, North Carolina, it's spread over 20 miles since its introduction in that area in 2000. Um, and indeed, I was down there uh, collecting myself for about a week. In a two-week period, over 12,000 were collected from this area for release elsewhere. And indeed, in Georgia, also, um, the work of Bud Mayfield, he's, he found uh, an average uh, of five Laracobius nigrinus larvae per 20 centimeters of shoot. And that's an awful lot of uh, hemlock lily, or of Laracobius um, for that small amount of shoot, 20 centimeters. Um, so in New York State, what have we been doing? Um, so we have one location in the Hudson Valley where we've released in 2005 where we have yet to find establishment, but I've released it in 13 locations in the Finger Lakes to date in 2008, 2012, and 2013, and I released two biotypes, one from Puget Sound and one from Idaho, which has been shown to be more cold adapted. Now, I, I, you know, it's like we do need to do more work with this, but the Idaho biotype appears to be more cold uh, tolerant than the Puget Sound biotype. But we have both of these biotypes established uh, out here from my 2008 release. So we have F5 generations. I'm waiting for them to begin to really grow into uh, the, uh, how do you say, I'm looking to find a lot of them. Um, I still have yet to find uh, them in any quantities. But just to, to backtrack to the story of North Carolina. I was very impressed when I went down there this spring or this fall to collect uh, Laracobius. This is Hemlock Hill near Banner Elk, North Carolina, where they first found it. Here you can see all these dead hemlocks. Um, it really, the hemlock lily adelgid started going rapidly, um, but here you can see there's still some in here with a little bit of canopy in them. This is one of the first release sites for Laracobius nigrinus in 2003. Um, obviously, it didn't save the big old ones, but there are a few in here, uh, and Laracobius are present in this area. This is, this is where I collected almost, near to where I collected almost 3,000 Laracobius uh, within a week. Uh, Grandfather Mountain Golf and Country Club, um, they had the wherewithal to fund uh, the uh, release of Laracobius in large numbers. Basically, they first detected it in 2002. They treated trees from 2003 to 2007 with a new culprit to save them. But then they started releasing the Laracobius nigrinus in 2008. And from that point, from 2008 to 2010, 2000, I mean, 10,800 were released. This is uh, Dick McDonald's work. Um, and I was just down there collecting with him, and we drove all around to see how far we could find it away. And we found it 20, about 20 miles from Grandfather Mountain Golf and Country Club in all directions, uh, which was pretty amazing. 
Um, and indeed, we collected here at, the, at, a, at a hedge in the, at this country club, and we kept we got hundreds of them. And the interesting thing is that um, it's like in fall of 2013, we caught 12,000 Aracobias, but we I would keep coming back to this hedge here. You look at that nice green foliage on it. It's about eight feet tall, 30 feet long. Um, and I would keep going back there day after day, and I'd keep collecting 200 Aracobias at least every day. And it was getting cold at that time of year. And this is at the country club. Again, I would come back here day after day and kind of collect over 200. Um, and that is, is uh, you know, it's like we don't have uh, a lot of, you know, hard evidence that it's having an impact. But I, I just can't believe that you're collecting so many of the Aracobias and they're not impacting the hemolocally adulterate populations. Um, and here we have some near, this is an area that was not released in, but near the country club. And you see that there are still some survivors in, in this area. But once again, this is anecdotal and not really solid information. But here you see some as well. Uh, you got some that are defoliated, but others that are still retain, retaining their canopy. So, you know, the story is I have hope um, for the use of Vericobius, and hopefully, you know, we'll, we can use it in conjunction with judicious use of, of systemic insecticides to really uh, control uh, hemocloid adulterate. So this is, shows you how we transport them. The uh, insect, this is a, a diet that they feed on during transport on this, uh, what we call excelsior, which is wood shavings, and we release them on the trees, and here they are um, on the trees. So these are the release points in the Finger Lakes area where I've released. These are the early uh, release points right here, uh, paired on each side uh, with uh, Puget Sound and um, um, uh, Idaho biotypes. And the rest of these, these are from um, these are from labs uh, in, this, in Virginia and Tennessee. And then these are uh, wild collected uh, releases from my trip down to uh, North Carolina just recently. 2013. Now, what I'm trying to do, and I think what we really need to think about, is the establishing uh, field insectaries up here, so we have a ready source of our own uh, insects produced. I, I was very impressed with these hedges down in North Carolina. Uh, boy, they get a lot of sun, and, and they're very hot. I, I, it's, it's a trying thing. This is here I am inoculating the trees uh, with, with hemlock lily adelgids, and I, I have a problem in that it's it's not an easy thing to do when you want to infest a tree with hemlock lily adelgids. I think I'm getting a lot of mortality in the summer, and so I'm still looking, uh, still refining the techniques. But suffice it to say, I think field insectaries insectaries are an important part of our uh, future up here uh, in New York and elsewhere. Uh, where hemocloid adelgid is expanding into. So integrated pest management of hemocloid adelgid, um, it's been established for years, but it's still expanding in New York. I think now is really the time to get on it um, so that we get biocontrol going and we get our own insectaries up and running. I think we need to use insecticide treatments. They're efficacious and relatively inexpensive. They're an important tool to collapse, to keep select trees alive, and they're by maintain a diverse gene pool. Also, when we have the aesthetic importance of, say, our state parks, you know, it's here in Tuganic Park, Treeman Park, Watkins Glen, and now Letchworth Park. I think it's a really important tool to maintain not only the genes, uh, gene pool over the landscape, but also to maintain the, the aesthetics uh, of these of these cherished areas. Classical biocontrol is necessarily a very long process, and results in the landscape are just beginning to become apparent. I think we really need to. This is not a short-term thing, and that's why we really need to get going. And I think we have promising hemolocally adulterated predators. We need to ramp up production and the releases combined with monitoring uh, to evaluate efficacy. Um, so. The next steps for management, I think we need to develop region-wide priorities for management. I think that uh, we really need to have, as land managers, um, a really uh, important discussion about where we're going to put our limited resources, where are we going to put these small amounts of uh, predators out uh, that we get. Um, and once again, I think it's really important to identify, to identify and maintain the genetic resources across the landscape. Uh, with insect systemic insecticides, you know, I just can't. Uh, I just, as I grew up working in the forests of of the Pacific Northwest, uh, we looked at the provenance of of seed as a very important aspect to maintaining genetic diversity, and I still believe that's the case. 
Uh, because you look at hemlocks, I mean, down in, uh, at some of these areas, hemlocks look different. Same species, they really do look different in different areas. Um, engage professional uh, land managers and volunteers in the management efforts. I think detection is critical, uh, getting in there early, uh, knowing where the populations are, identifying where the best places are to release the, uh, the biocontrols, and monitoring uh, over the long haul. This is not a short-term proposition. I think we're really, uh, uh, we really need to consider this as something, uh, this is a 50-year project in my mind, um, and establish field and sectaries uh, across the region uh, so that uh, regionally adapted predators can be produced and so that we can really spread this out uh, uh, rather than have it focused just from one location. Um, and I do believe I cannot end my talk without this cartoon. I, I got a, a raft of uh, comments before when I left it out. I know it's in the dashboard, but I, I love it, and it's important. And the animal dashboard is still an important issue. So with that, I have just a couple minutes left for questions or as many, as much time as you would want to allow. Pete, it's up to you now. Great work. Very well done. Um, thank you. So the, and there are some questions. There were some that came in. OK. Will, if you want, I'll just, I, I think I know where they are, so I'll read them off to you. Uh, one question was whether or not uh, western hemlock that occurs in the east is susceptible to hemlock woolly adulthood. That's a good question. Yeah. People have come here. The western hemlock just don't seem to do as well out here as they do out west. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm uncertain about, uh, I have not seen western hemlock planted out here. Uh, that's, that looks very good at all. Um, if somebody has uh, other information, I'd, I'd like to hear about it. Um, um, then Tom Ward asks, why would eastern hemlock in the Washington region be thriving in spite of the adult infestation? Well, that's that's a good question. I, I you know, I, I keep thinking it must be because of the great coffee. But you know, really, I. I <laughs> You know, there's a, there is a very well-established and abundant natural enemy complex out there, predator complex. And so I think that's a part of the question. And I keep asking myself, perhaps is there something about that environment that triggers a resistance mechanism in, in the tsuga that uh, allows it to survive? And, you know, I don't know. It's like all these species are different. You know, one of the interesting aspects of tsuga is that here we have, you know, tsuga heterophila and mertensiana in the Pacific Northwest that are closely re related, and they don't have, uh, they're not, uh, Mertensianus, I've never seen him like Willie Delgin on it, but then you look at the species here uh, on the east coast, we have Caroliniana and, and uh, Canadensis, and eastern hemlock Canadensis is highly susceptible, and as is Caroliniana, but you know what? They're not very close together as far as the genetics of Tsuga go. The Caroliniana is actually more closely related to the Chinese species, uh, or to the Asian species that are actually resistant, whereas uh, 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 Canadensis is more closely related uh, to, to the heterophila group. And so here you have a situation, and, and it actually that plays out because the Caroliniana uh, readily hybridizes with the Asian species, but we can't get Canadensis to hybridize very well with the Asian species. So, you know, there's a lot of questions relating to the host tree and its response, and, you know, there's just, uh, I just, I, I go, I walk away from this every time I, I go to a new area, I, I just walk away with far more questions uh, than I started with. Um, okay. Um, Jeremy is asking about uh, the, uh, how these different control programs may play out on public land versus private land. We have the, the golf course country club would obviously be a private lands. Yeah. Um, are they, so maybe, and you also sh I think illustrated it after about 10 years, there was pretty good spread. So if, yeah, let so me, let me get to on the kind of that interface of pi public, pu uh, excuse me, public land and private land. Okay. Uh, let me first. Uh, Charles Beer had a very good comment, and I, I, I'm sorry I missed that, Charles. Yes, uh, he says, isn't that a different adelgid than would be getting on the eastern hemlock at the Washington Arboretum? Yes, that's very true. It is a different 
individual. It is a different group um, of adults, and that could be part of the, the uh, solution, part of the explanation as well. Thank you for reminding me about that. Okay, so back to the private uh, uh, public thing. Um, yeah, the uh, the country club with with all the bucks down there in North Carolina. I mean, that was an expensive proposition. Um, there was uh, they have the wherewithal to pay for that, and actually the local area benefited very much from that bio control effort. I mean, releasing 10,000 or almost 11,000 Lyricobius is a big deal. Um, when I do releases up here, I release maybe 500. And I'm indeed at uh, the first four locations I released, I released only 200. So, you know, it's like I think that that's important. I think it's important to get private entities involved in this process because heaven knows our government uh, keeps, you know, reducing the amount of money available for all sorts of things out there. Um, and so I, I, you know, I think that the getting the private entities involved is important because, you know, actually, you know, that country club determined that their hemlocks were really important and it was worth it for them to engage in a very aggressive management uh, program. Okay. Uh, there's another question I wanted to address here uh, that I forgot about, uh, and that was, um, uh, boy, oh, boy. oh, what is the impact of imidacloprid uh, on Lyricobius? And, you know, basically, imidacloprid, when it gets into the tree, it kills the, kills the adelgids quickly. And, um, you know, it's like, basically, the Lyricobius, I, I hate to put it into anthropomorphic terms, but they aren't dumb. And, you know, they're not going to eat a bug that isn't, you know, big and juicy. Uh, if it's dead and, and rank, you know, it's like they're not, uh, uh, work in the laboratory shows that they're not eaten. And indeed, when they're force-fed uh, uh, these, these poisoned adelgids, they don't die. Um, they just sort of like go into some kind of stupor. And I remember one of my friends referring to them as stoners. So, you know, we don't really, I don't really think that that's a problem. And I do, and because, and I do think that the advantages of using uh, um, pesticides to preserve magnificent individuals and releasing Laracobius in the same area so uh, uh, is a good one. It's like for the state parks, that's what we're doing. We're leaving young trees, young vigorous trees untreated with the insecticide so they can harbor populations of the hemlock woolly adelgid for the predator to develop on and will treat the big trees that really can't take the uh, uh, prolonged impact of hemlock woolly adelgid and also represent really valuable genes because after all what is a big tree in a stand? You know that's the tree that's been there the longest and has withstood the test of time and so those genes are really valuable I think when you consider establishing future populations of that species. Okay, so you got another question for me, yep. Pete? Oh, there's several. So Allison wants to know how long after tree planting in the field and sectory did you wait for uh, inoculation of the inoculated algae? Well, I actually started immediately, um, and I. You know, I don't think that was really wise because, you know, the trees that I got were donated to me by Schichtel's Nursery, by the way, out in western New York, and I, I really thank them uh, for their donation. It was really great. I have 65 trees out there now. Um, after the second year when they really got a study, that first year was really hard on them. It was a hot, dry year, and uh, they, they didn't do very well. They didn't produce very many shoots. Um, and so the second year, though, they had lots of new shoots, and they looked really great. And so now I'm, 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 I, I held back uh, on a lot of my trees, and so I'm waiting for them to really get vigorous um, before I go back to um, uh, inoculating them with the adelgid. Okay. Um, Peter wants to know if you can uh, do the insect, I'm sorry, insecticide applications to just the trunk of the hemlock trees or to the entire uh, tree and canopy need to be sprayed? Oh, really good question. I'm sorry, I, I, you know, there's just too much to talk about in this talk. I hope I'm not uh, going too fast for you. But basically, um, the insecticide, basal trunk spray um, of the insecticide, it's just you spray the lower five or six feet of the tree uh, until, it's, until it's wet. 
but not dripping off. Uh, and that's all you need to do. It, that way it gets into the tissue. It actually goes through the bark, believe it or not. I, I found it sort of interesting that something would soak through the bark so quickly. Uh, and then it gets into the pink active tissue and is transported up into the top of the tree. So no, you don't need to expose uh, all sorts of, you know, get all this drift and everything. It's a very, very uh, 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 precise application. It does not spread around. I think it's a, a, an ecologically very good way to go. Okay. Uh, Paul wants to know if private landowners can purchase Laracobius, um, how to do that and how much do they cost? Oh, that is another very good question. Um, Dick McDonald uh, down in North Carolina has been uh, doing this for the Grandfather uh, uh, Mountain Golf and Country Club, and uh, he is the guy to approach um, about this. And um, I can get his email out. If you want to send me an email, I'll send you his contact information. I'm not really sure. You know, it's like it's one guy doing it. I, I certainly don't have the time to do it. Um, and so uh, the best thing to do is just to contact him. Um, you can't you can't get them from the Forest Service or the labs. Those were all designated for research purposes. All right. And so, if you want to send Mark an email, his email is on the on display there. MCW42 at Cornell.edu. Okay. Uh, Chris wants to know what's the best time to treat infested trees with the injected insecticides. Um, the best time to treat is I I'd say in spring or in fall. Um, when that's when the trees, basically you want the, the ground to be damp, uh, you want the trees to be transpiring actively. Spring is, is you know, I think it's always the best uh, for trees to get it in there, but a fall treatment will also work. The trees are active uh, in fall before the temperatures decline. Okay. Uh, Caitlin wants to know if the white uh, woolly egg sacs on our are seen on a hemlock tree. Is the culprit definitely hemlock woolly adelgid or any other insects in New York that produce white woolly egg sacs? Um, there are no insects, other insects that, that uh, produce those kind of sacs. And I, I recommend you, you know, go to the literature, get online, look at the literature so you really know what you're looking at. The only other thing that would have a woolly looking sac on it would be uh, perhaps a spider egg sac. Um, there are a lot of things that, you know, are white. But also, the interesting thing, I always get fooled when there's a, a white pine around and sap is dripping on the tree, and I'll see those little white spots of sap uh, on the tree from a distance. Um, so, you know, those those are the only two things that really resemble uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid. Okay. Um, Paul wants to know about uh, continuing uh, education credits. Those have been applied for, and I will send the link to all of the registered participants so that if you're interested, you'll be able to sign up for those. Um, I'll also do that with the uh, exit survey. I have those available, but I'm because of some computer problems I had earlier, I don't want to be uh, monkeying around bringing up those files. Okay, Doug wants to know if uh, you think that the systemic pesticides are going to be outlawed as they have been in Europe. Don't ask me to predict what government regulators are going to do. <laughs> okay. Um, but I'll tell you this. Um, I think that it's uh, the, the neonicotinids. Um, you know, I got into uh, forest entomology uh, because I was really upset with the use of uh, pesticides in the environment. Uh, and indeed, my major professor would probably turn in his grave if he knew that I was recommending the use of insecticides uh, uh, but I, I really have become an advocate of their use to try and save, uh, save species, save uh, hemlock across the landscape. Um, it's, it's, I think it's a really valuable tool, and it's not a problem. I think one of the problems that they're looking at uh, and, and might uh, uh, severely limit the use of, of the neonicotinoids is the impact on honeybees. And if you consider um, hemlocks, or ash, for that matter. They're, they are um, they're wind pollinated trees. There are no extraforal nectaries. There's no reason for a bee to feed on any exudates of ash or of hemlock. And so I think that you know these these new nicotinids, You know maybe in some instances uh, they could impact uh, bee populations, but certainly not with hemlocks and with ash. And I think they offer a really valuable tool 
uh, to try to save uh, these trees on the landscape. Okay. Uh, Brian wants to know if in areas that have not yet been infested with the hemlock woolly adulgid, are there any preventive measures that could be taken? No, I don't think uh, prevention is a, uh, an operational strategy with this insect. I think the best thing to do uh, is to uh, detect it as early as possible. And once you have detection, um, then start. you can start formulating your management plans ahead of time. And then when you detect it, you can begin implementing those plans. The same thing with, with the emerald ash borer. You know, it's early detection and rapid response. That's, that's the name of the game. And so once you, once you develop those plans, you, have, you know what you're going to do. You know which trees you're going to treat and you know, which trees you're going to let go. You're going to know if there's any sources of bug and coal agents uh, or who to contact uh, to see about getting into those programs. So, so, um, you know, no, uh, the thing is, is that it, the hemlock will adulge, it will get uh, to spread to all our hemlocks. Um, I don't think there's going to be ever be any protected areas, and so we really need to begin uh, thinking about what you're going to do when it does get there. And I also got to say, uh, in some instances, I've seen trees that have been infested and have show crown symptoms that have been saved with the application of insecticides. So it's not like with emerald ash borer where you have to immediately get in there and treat your trees, otherwise they're going to be gone. Uh, with the hemlock lily adelgid, you can actually, uh, um, you can wait till you see it in there, so you, and even do you see some canopy symptoms and still apply the insecticide and, and save the tree. Okay. Uh, Paul wants to know if you can re-describe or describe again uh, the establishment of the insector. Oh, okay. I, I just glanced over that because I wanted to leave enough time for questions. I, I always tend to try and fit too much into a talk. You know, basically what I did is I got a field here next to the Cornell campus, um, and uh, I have I got 65 uh, hemlock trees, and I put them in the ground, um, and I'm hoping to grow them up not only to uh, rear, get large numbers of predators from, but also to do some experiments to look at competition and those kinds of things. Now, my thoughts are that actually I think we might need to do other things, like perhaps those hedges that they got down in uh, North Carolina. Those hedges produced so much, so many insects. I was, I was really impressed. And so I think my next step might be to find some locations uh, where I can make some of those dense hedges uh, to, and, and, and also I've been talking with uh, my, my friend Jerry Carlson out there in Albany with DEC um, about starting up some of these insectaries uh, around the state. I think it's really important um, that we start working as a state uh, towards this, you know, not just in a haphazard manner, but, but look, you know, identify our valuable resources like Letchworth Park, like Treeman Park or Allegheny Park, and really, you know, focus on when it does get there, what are we going to do? What's our response? Be ready to go rather than waiting around. All right. And so maybe that kind of plays into this next question. Andy has acres of hemlock, a Canadian hemlock, and uh, it sounds like the insect predators are the best control option. Um, but so how do we, you know, in, in, in areas where the, the bug is not yet occurring, how do we prepare for those? Okay, so, you know, it's like if I was a private landowner and I had like 100 acres of hemlock, uh, what I would do is I'd go through there and take a tally of what you have um, and, and really look at the, the, the trees. You know, think about um, like how much is it going to cost for you to apply uh, the insecticides. Remember, you know, if you get a midocopid into the tree before there's canopy deterioration, much canopy deterioration, you got seven more years after that. Midocopid is not an expensive insecticide. And so, you know, figure out which trees you want to treat um, and then which trees you would be happy to let go. And of course, it all depends on how much money you have to spend. You know, somebody might have all the money to treat all their trees. Um, you know, it's like, and that, you know, the biocontrol is the long term. Um, I would love to see like at uh, a banner at uh, Grandfather Mountain Golf and Country Club where, you know, you get a population going and, and they start spreading across the landscape like crazy and, uh, and, you know, so that you don't need to do any more introductions. But uh, I think that it's going to take a long time 
uh, for that to happen. And I'm not really sure that the Arcobius is going to respond like that up here. It is colder up here, and you know, I'm, I'm, I just I don't want to say yes. You know, we're going to be able to duplicate that effort. I think that uh, biological control is a long-term project, and we have to uh, uh, not bank on that. I think we need to, if you want to save trees on your forest, plan to work with insecticides until we can get that biocontrol going. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to jump out of sequence here just so I can catch some folks before they leave. Uh, one reminder, I'll send out the continuing education link and the exit survey link separately. Uh, for those of you that want a copy of this presentation, I forgot to do this at the beginning, in the upper left-hand corner, if you go to the File menu and then go to Save As, you're able to save the document as a PDF file. So that would provide you, like Peter was asking about, uh, the names of the different insecticides. So this would be a way for you to capture the names of those insecticides. So file menu and then save as. You can save the document as a PDF. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, what's the effect, uh, Deborah wants to know about the effect on birds who eat insects from uh, aminocloprid treated trees. Is there transmission to birds? Is there other kind of ripple effects that need to be considered? Well, you know, as as with Aracobius, I think that you know the, the insecticides, um, you know, once they get in the tree, you know, they're going to kill the uh, adulgids before they get to any substantial size. Um, and then once they die, they they don't look very juicy. I mean, they don't look very uh, appetizing. And the same is true with them. Well, the ash borer, um, you know, it's like the, 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 as soon as the insect feeds on it, it dies, and usually that's at a very early stage in its development. And, you know, I, woodpeckers actually, uh, watching woodpeckers work on ash trees, um, they actually wait until the end of the growing season when the emerald ash borer is at its biggest and juiciest before they go attacking it. Um, and indeed, you know, with birds on, on hemlock trees, I have not seen them birds foraging on hemlock trees very often, but I imagine it would be the first, the, the same thing, where they're really only going to go for the uh, insects that are larger and very few. Are lots to be, I think, uh, how to say, appetizing. I hate to use that word because it's anthrop anthropomorphic, but, you know, be appetizing to the insect or to the birds. So no, I, I, I don't really consider that to be a potential problem. Okay. Um, is there a negative effect of the hemlock woolly adulgent on spruce? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think the answer is, is, uh, uh, is goes back to the basis of the fact that it's a native insect in those areas, and the populations of spruce have adapted uh, to uh, have evolved with the insect. So no, it's not a problem. Um, you know, the interesting question in my mind is, why the heck doesn't the adult get onto spruce in North America? I mean, here it's been in the Pacific Northwest for how long? You know, long, long time, uh, tens of thousands of years, and in and yet still has not evolved to work to utilize any of the spruce species in the Pacific Northwest. And um, and indeed, you know, here I have right actually inside my office uh, uh, at Cornell Arboretum, we have planted uh, Picea purita, which is the spruce that the hemlock will uh feeds on in Japan. And I have yet to see any evidence uh, that it has gone on to those trees. And in speaking with my friend Nathan Havel, who's done a lot of work in Japan, he says that he really does not see very much evidence of hemlock lily adulgid on Picea polita in Japan, where it's native. So no, it doesn't. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity to espouse on those, those, the those interesting theories that are bouncing around in my brain. Yep. OK. Uh, Tom is uh, talking about honeybees, and presumably you were mentioning this earlier, honeybees um, also collect resin from trees to manufacture propolis. Um, and he's wondering if maybe foraging for this resin could be a, uh, an occasion when they would come in contact with trees that are have been treated with uh, hmm. uh, neonicotoids. Huh. Yeah, I'm I'm really not familiar with that. That's a possibility. Um, I do know that uh, hemlock are really not a heavy uh, uh, resin producer. 
Um, certainly the, uh, the resin producers are the pines uh, and the spruce. So you know, that's interesting. I, I hadn't thought of that. I appreciate the, uh, uh, the question, and I'm going to uh, talk to my uh, bee expert friends about this. I've spoken at length with my uh, bee expert friends about uh, uh, the utilization of honeybees, uh, honeybees utilizing um, uh, hemlocks and ash, but I haven't really uh, addressed that. And I'll do that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. And then um, I guess the final question is, what is it about the hedges that made them such a good source? Was it the age or the density or the sun exposure? This Boy, you know, I, there's, I, if, <laughs> if you could tell me, I, I would be very happy. I, I, I've been thinking about this ever since I was down there and, and saw that uh, phenomenon. You know, there's also got to be something with the soil. Uh, you know, it's like I'm, I'm wondering what is the optimal soil for uh, Lercobius to drop down into and to pupate and to spend the, winter, the summertime. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of factors that go in there. You know, it's like, yes, a thick hedge, it modifies the environment, you know, the humidity would be increased, uh, the, the, the light regime would be different from open grown tree. There are a lot of things that are different. Um, I don't know. Now, I, I got to say that just right down the street from that location, there were some open grown trees uh, in a park around a parking lot that also yielded great amounts of, of, uh, of Laracobius. Um, and so it wasn't a hedge. They weren't heavily crimped, but they still yielded uh, lots of bugs. So I don't really know, um, but I, I know enough that it's actually a very efficient way to collect the Laracobius, just going right down that head, beating on the, the branches, you knock the Laracobius into your uh, beet sheet, and then you just suck them up. So um, uh, operationally, in, 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 in recovering Hemocloid Delta, the, uh, the hedges work really well. Why they do so well there, I, I, I don't know. If you have any suggestions, I'm open. Okay. Good. Well, Mark, this is um, this is fantastic. We're uh, it looks like we're out of questions, and we've, uh, we've we've taxed you with an extra 22 minutes of questions. So this is you've gone above and beyond the call of duty. Oh, uh, my thanks to you, and uh, thanks to all the participants. Uh, you can see that there are several people that are offering their thanks as well. I'll bring closure to the noon session, and Mark and I will be back at 7 p.m. this evening. If you all want to see it again, you can, or <laughs> it'll uh, we'll we'll um, we'll say this this has been uh, recorded. We'll archive it onto the Forest Connect YouTube site. So thank you, Mark. All right, Pete. Thank you all. Thank you, and thank for thank everybody.